morning and welcome to Online Worship. I'm Leslie Anderson and I am your Director of Connections and I wanna welcome you on this Sunday morning. In just a few moments, you're gonna get another Bible story that you need to know from our Pastor Megan. If you have questions about Crossroads Global Methodist Church, email me at any time. But now let's prepare our hearts. Online Church starts right now. Well, hey there, and welcome to Online Worship. My name is Megan Honig. I'm the associate pastor here on staff at Crossroads, and it's so good to worship with you online today. We're continuing our sermon series over um, Bible stories that you need to know in the book of Luke. So we'll get there in just a moment um, as we begin uh, this today. So would you pray with me before we get started? Dear God, we thank you for uh, the ability to come together to worship online and uh, to be with you no matter where we are, Lord. God, I pray that you would open our hearts and ears to receive what you have in this message today for us, Lord. Uh, God, would you help us to be open to receiving it? And Lord, as I preach, uh, let me say nothing that is not of you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So my job now as a pastor is actually somewhat similar to the very first job that I ever had. In my job now, I manage lots of people, not only church staff, but also I manage all the church people as well, God's people. And in my first job, I also managed people. I was a supervisor of a concession stand at one of the baseball parks in my hometown where uh, my peers and friends played baseball. I was probably only about 16 years old when I got this job, um, and it was actually a lot of responsibility for a 16-year-old. I had keys to the ballpark. I managed a few hundred dollars in cash every day. I signed timesheets for the concession stand workers and scorekeepers who were about my age, but also for the adult men who were umpires, uh, which felt weird. It was up to me, a 16-year-old, if a 35-year-old male umpire got paid, so that was weird. Uh, but every time I worked, I had to manage all of the people who worked there and also all of the food in the concession stand as well. And now I was a pretty honest teenager and I did a really good job managing everything that I had to. I never pocketed any of the money or took home anything that I shouldn't have. Uh, but the one thing that got me was eating the snacks at the ball field while I was working. We were allowed a soda or a Gatorade while we were working, but we had to pay for anything else we wanted while I, uh, we were there. And I was usually pretty good about this rule, but I'd be lying if I didn't say I never snuck a free cookie sandwich or a pack of peanut M&Ms. But in that aspect, maybe I wasn't a good manager, but with everything else in that job, I did do pretty good. And likewise, in our scripture today, I find uh, we find Jesus telling his disciples a parable about a manager who had been dishonest and what that manager does when he is caught up in his dishonesty. So here now, as we start in uh, Luke 16, verses 1 and 2. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called the men and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. So this parable starts off with a very rich man who is employing a manager to oversee all of his money. This was really common back in Jesus' day to employ someone to manage your assets. Today, we do the same thing with CPAs or financial advisors, and we hire these people to help manage our money to make sure we are using it and investing it in the most effective way possible. And this was similar to what a manager did in Jesus' time. However, the distinction is that the manager was over all the master's business, and so they're the ones who made sure that people paid their bills to their master. And so if the master was a business owner of some sort, the manager was in charge of all the accounting for the business, and he also made sure people who owed their master money paid their bills. And in biblical times, the way these managers got paid was through a commission of sorts. Typically, when the master would hire a manager, the manager was allowed to charge a little extra on top of anything that people already owed the manager. 
So if people owed the manager $500 for something, the manager would charge a little extra money on top, say $200 or something, for a total of $700. And so he would go to that debtor and say, hey, you owe my master $700. And when it was time to collect that debt and the person paid the $700, the manager would take that $700 and give his master 500 that he was owed and then keep the extra 200 for themselves, which was how these uh, managers got paid. And so one day, while the manager was at work, the master confronted the manager about some rumors that he had heard, namely that he was wasting his master's possessions and not managing his assets well. So he could have been doing something like embezzling his master's money or spending it on things he shouldn't, something like that. Uh, but he's been caught for mismanaging this money. And so the master tells him that he is going to have to give an account for what he has done with his money. And he's also going to be fired and out of a job. And I wonder how the manager felt when he was found out by his master. Because up until this point, it seems like the manager was just living as if he would never be held to account. He wasn't worried about having to one day explain to his master what he'd been doing, uh, because if he hadn't, he would have just never mismanaged the money in the first place. And now this sudden account has taken him by surprise, and his stomach is probably in knots trying to figure out what he's going to do to survive, now that he's lost his job because of his dishonesty. And the truth is that one day we will also have to give an account to our manager because all that we have been given on earth is God's. All the time, possessions, talents, gifts, our bodies and our influence are all God's. They are his assets that he has given us to manage so that the kingdom of God can be advanced. And God has trusted us with these things so that we can one day use them to make more disciples of Jesus and make his name known upon all the earth. And so at every moment of every day, we are stewarding God's resources so that one day every follower of God will stand before him in heaven and will have to answer about how we have managed these assets of God's. And I don't want you to end up like this manager, surprised by the accounting. I want you to remember that all that you do in this earthly life will one day be questioned by God, and you have to do your best now to manage the things that God has given you in a way that honors Him. And these are things like managing your time well. We all have time, and we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And so how do you use those 24 hours in a way that manages, that, that honors God? I believe there are many ways that you are already managing your time wisely. Like right now, for example, you've decided to listen to the sermon and learn a little bit more about God. That is a good management of your time. And after this, you may be going to spend some time with family. That's also a good management of your time. Taking care of your kids or other family, that's a good use of time. Volunteering in the community or serving at church, it's a good use of time. Working is a good use of time. Sleeping is a good use of time. Nourishing and taking care of your body is a good use of time. There are so many ways that are good uses of time that we already do. But there are also ways that we misuse and waste time as well. And you can probably think of a, th a few things that you do as well that waste time and aren't honoring to God. For me, it could be something like scrolling through my phone too much. It's one thing to scroll and to look at social media, but it's an outright bad use of time if you're doing it too much or if you're using it to be an escape from something. That's obviously a bad use of time. You have to manage um, your time well so that what you do can be honoring to God. Another thing that you have to manage well is your possessions. One day, you will stand before God and have to answer him about how you have managed the things that he has given you, because after all, all of it is God, 
not just the first 10%. The other 90 is God's as well. Everything that we have is his. So how have you honored him with your money? How have you honored him with your home? How have you honored him with your car or your lawnmower or your oven or your phone or your silverware? You may think honoring God with those things sounds silly, but God doesn't think that they're silly. He's given them to you so that you can be at your full potential to spread the name of Jesus. Everything that we own can be used to make disciples of Jesus and to further our relationship with him as well. So how are you using them? How are you using your possessions? Are you wasting them? Are you using them for good? Are you managing them well? You also must manage your talents and your gifts. Now, I know what a lot of you might be thinking already. I don't have any talents or gifts. Well, you are wrong. God gave each of us unique talents and gifts and skills and abilities when he created us. Your talent or gift might be something like singing or playing an instrument, or it may be teaching kids about Jesus or comforting the sick or sitting with a friend who is in despair. Your gift may also be um, looking like organizing and managing systems well or cooking for your family or planning or decorating for events. Every gift and talent that we have can be used to glorify God, and he expects you to use them to do so. Are you using them well? You must also manage your bodies well. This is an important one. Our bodies are gifts from God that he has given to us to be able to not only experience God, but also help others meet and experience God as well. And if we don't manage our bodies well, we can't manage anything else that I've listed here either. And managing our bodies includes managing the physical aspects of our bodies and making sure that we are as physically healthy as we can be. That includes eating healthy foods, exercising, taking any medication that you're supposed to, going to the doctor to make sure that you're physically well. And managing our boss bodies also includes taking care of the mental and emotional needs that we have as well. That means talking to professionals when we need to, taking breaks when we need to and resting, and also confiding in people that we trust in when we need support. Our bodies are complex and beautiful gifts from God that he has given and entrusted to us to take care of and to use to further his work here on earth. Will you care for your body and manage it well for the glory of God? And lastly, you must manage your influence. This may be one that you hadn't thought of, but each of us has influence in our lives in one way or another. Parents, you have influence over your kids. How will you use that influence to raise them to be followers of Jesus? Business owners, how will you use the influence you have in your business to make Jesus known? Managers, supervisors, or teachers, how will you treat those you lead so that they might see the peace and confidence that you have in Jesus and want it for themselves? And we all have friends and family. How are we using our influence with them to make sure that they accept Jesus and go to heaven one day? We are very influential, more than I think we really know. And just like we can influence those around us for good, we can also influence them negatively if we don't care and don't do anything to influence them for the glory of God. Manage your influence well and use it wisely. It is one of the most powerful tools you have. Now, this isn't a comprehensive list of all the things that we manage. Literally anything that we have influence over and possession of is something that we manage. And we have to remember to use each of those and manage each of those things well to further God's kingdom um, here on earth. One day, every follower of Jesus will stand in front of him and give an account for how we've managed his resources, which let's be honest, is a little nerve wracking. 
to think about giving an account of everything that I've done in my life seems a little scary because I haven't always made the best decisions. And that nervous knot in your stomach that you might feel thinking about this is probably how the manager felt when the master called him up to say, you're fired and I need you to give some explaining about how you spent my money because he hadn't made the best decisions either. And after the manager calls, uh, after the master calls the manager to tell him that he's about to be fired, this is what it says. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each one of his master's debtors and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. And then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. Once the manager hears that he has been found out, and his master is going to hold him accountable and lose his job, he reacts in an interesting way. He goes through a few different scenarios in his head about how he's going to support himself once he loses his job. He says he's not strong enough to do physical labor, that won't work. And he can't just be a beggar on the street because he could never stoop that low or do that. And so he comes up with a plan to talk to his master's current clients and debtors and good on their good side so that when he's out of a job, they will take pity on him and welcome him into their homes. And he does that by going to a few clients and discounting their bills, cutting them a deal so that they would be appreciative towards him and like him. And honestly, this isn't a bad plan. I would love if the owner, if someone at a company like the power company made me, called me and said, you know what, your bill is supposed to be $200, but how about you just give me 100 and we'll call it good? I would love that. And I bet you would love whoever gave you that deal. This is a strategy that the manager takes. However, it's funny because he's not really giving them a deal at all, likely. It's likely that he is really just chopping his commission off the top and charging the people what they really owe in order to get the master the money that's owed to him while also making it look like the people are getting a deal. This is very clever of the manager. And I also wanna take a moment to point out the ways that the manager doesn't react when he finds out he's going to be held accountable and lose his job. He doesn't just ignore the master and say, yeah, right, my boss really isn't gonna do anything to me. Don't worry about it, it'll be fine. He doesn't try to cover up what he had done, and he doesn't um, try to be even more dishonest to the master. He knows that he's messed up. He also doesn't procrastinate preparing for giving an account of losing his job, because what would have happened if he waited to prepare for his future would have been bad. It wouldn't have ended well if he just put off and put it off and put it off until the manager came to account. Like in real life, what would happen if we were being audited by the IRS and instead of spending the time preparing for the audit and giving things in order, we procrastinate until the night before and then show up to the meeting with a bag of receipts that we haven't even really looked at. That would be bad, that would be awful. You have to prepare for something like that. And instead, this man doesn't procrastinate or try to be dishonest or anything. Instead, he says, you know what? I need to prepare for when I'm held for account. And you know what? I triggered this decision to prepare instead of procrastinate or avoid guilt. The manager knew he was guilty on all accounts and he wasn't always like this. For a long time, he lived like he would never be called to account for what he was doing. But the moment that he realized he would, and he knew he was going to be guilty, he did something. 
He made his plan to get on the good side of the master's clients so that when he lost his job, he would have somewhere to go. He used his present position to prepare for his next phase of life. Do you see where I'm going with this? One day, we will be in a new phase of life, the heavenly phase of life, and we have to use our current position, our earthly life, to prepare for it. One day, we'll be asked by God how we used our earthly life, and we will have to give him an account. One day, we'll get to the next life and look around us and possibly also realize that the people who we thought were going to be there when we got there weren't actually there. How are you preparing those around you? Use your present position here on earth to prepare for your next phase of eternal life. This manager was good at that. So good, in fact, that the master comments on it in verse eight. It says, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. When the master saw what his manager was doing by getting on his client's good side, he complimented him on it. Which when I read this parable for the first time, it took me a while to understand why the master was complimenting the manager since he seemed to be doing something that was a little unethical. After all, the manager was only giving discounts to the clients because he wanted to go down their good side so that he could take advantage of them later. He wasn't giving them discounts of the goodness of his heart. He had ulterior motives. But this isn't what the master is complimenting him on. He's complimenting him on the fact that he is using his current position to prepare for his next phase of life. He did a good job preparing for when he was going to be out of a job. It says that he acted shrewdly, which means that he acted with sharp judgment. And in other versions of the Bible, um, they use the words wise or clever here. And so the master is saying, hey, good job. You may have wronged me and you still be may acting, still may be acting unethically, but that was a really smart move you just did. Really clever. Are we being clever with the things that God has given us? Are we using them to their full potential to honor him and to prepare for our next phase of life? Do we even give any thought to this at all? If we do, it's probably not as much as we should. And Jesus knows that because he points it out here. Jesus says to the disciples, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Ouch. <laughs> Jesus says that the people of the world are better at um, preparing for their future than the people of the light are, meaning Christians. He's saying worldly people are better at preparing for their worldly future than Christians are preparing for the eternal future. And I've got to give it to him. He's not wrong. Most people in this world today do a great job at preparing for their futures. We go to college so that we can get a good job in the future. We invest into our 401ks so that we can prepare for retirement. We make sacrifices during the year so that we can go on a nice vacation later or save up to buy a house or a car. We put more time in at work so that we'll be considered for a promotion and further our career. We are great at preparing for our earthly futures. We can do that. So why don't we put the same effort and attention into preparing for our heavenly futures? Is it just that we don't think about it? Is it that it makes us uncomfortable? Is it because we're lazy or we just make too many excuses? Would you imagine if every Christian in the world made it their first priority to prepare for their heavenly futures and use all of their time and talents and gifts and assets with the focus of furthering the kingdom of God? What would that look like? I think we would live in a totally different world. I think there's even a little bit of irony in it 
we prepare for our earthly futures, and those aren't even the ones that we are promised, right? We could die at any minute. The only promised future we have is eternal life, and that's the one that we avoid preparing for. Why do we do that? We have to be diligent about putting God's kingdom at the forefront of our minds because it is the calling that Jesus has put on the life of every single person that calls him Lord. He calls us to use all that we have to serve him and glorify him and make him known because he is the only one worthy of all of our praise because he's the only one who can come and save us. In verse nine, Jesus gives us our charge and he puts it simply. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth, meaning things or assets, to gain friends for yourselves, meaning to bring those around you to God or bring yourself closer to God, so that when it, your earthly life, is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus is saying, use everything you can now to bring yourself and others closer to God so that when your life is nearing its end and you don't have many assets left, you'll be welcomed into eternal life. And when you stand in front of God and he asks you to give an account for your life, you'll be able to look back and smile on all the ways that you have managed his assets well and all the ways that you have brought others to him and furthered his kingdom instead of looking back at a life that was wasted with knots in your stomach and having to answer God for what you did. And I also want to be clear about something. What you, what you give account for in front of God doesn't determine if you get into heaven or not. By putting your faith and trust in him and surrendering your life to God, you've already been redeemed into eternal life and nothing can take that away from you. Whether you do a little or you do a lot to further the kingdom of God, you've been covered by the blood of Jesus and you are already in heaven. However, I don't know about you, but when I want, one day when I stand in front of God, I wanna look back at my life and smile at the things I've done instead of look down in worry and shame. Use your current position to prepare for your next phase of life. And then Jesus goes on to say this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted in much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Whoever is trusted with little can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with little will be dishonest with much. If you can't be trusted with how you've managed God's assets that he's given you, he's probably not going to give you any more. If you've been dishonest with the little that you have, you'll obviously be dishonest with more. I think it's saying that if we want God to give us more in earthly life, and in the spiritual life, we have to prove that we are good stewards with the things that we already have. Perhaps if we prove that we can, um, th that we know how to glorify God with what we already have, then he'll give us more. It makes me wonder if when we pray to God and ask him for things like a promotion or more free time or more money or something, and then we don't get it, maybe, it's because we're not managing what we already have very well. I don't think God wants to give us more of his assets if we're not going to be wise with them. And then Jesus ends in this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. In light of this parable, I think that verse 13 
is one that we have quoted many times, but I think we possibly misunderstood it. I used to think that it meant that you can't value God and value money at the same time, like you had to just pick one, but I don't think that's exactly what it's saying. I think it's saying that you can't serve both God and money. You have to pick to serve one of them. And money, along with all of the other assets that we've talked about, is one of the things that God has given us to use to further his kingdom. And so I think it means that we have to value God over money and use our money to serve God and further his kingdom. We can value money and value those things that God has given us so long as we are using them to glorify God, the one who we are serving. If we ever put money above God and use um, money to serve ourselves, that's when everything goes wrong. If we are chasing after money and using it for the sole purpose of benefiting ourselves and not having God in our minds at all, then it is a master to us. But if we were trying to attain money so that we can use it to serve God and his kingdom, that is okay. That is the correct order of things there. It's not about valuing God or money. It's about who we are serving. Friends, what we do in this life not only influences our eternal life, but the life that we have right now. The more we are faithful to God, the more we are able to see the blessings that he has already so generously given us. So as you imagine in your last days of life, as you imagine yourself yourself taking your last breath and you enter into heaven and stand before the eternal God and he looks you in the eyes for the first time and asks you, what have you done for my kingdom? What will you say? What will you do? Will you look back on your life with a smile and list all of the ways that you have glorified God and tell God hundreds of stories where you saw him show up because of the ways that you had glorified him? We will list all of the ways that you brought your family to God. We will list all of the times that you sat with the least of these and helped them and told them of the love of Jesus. Or will you look back at your life with your head hung down, wishing that you had done more? I hope that you will look back and smile. Use what you have right now to prepare for your heavenly future. You will not regret it. The choice is yours. Choose wisely. Let's pray. Dear God, Lord, you have given us so much um, and we are so thankful that you have given us all the assets and that you have entrusted us with much, Lord. God, I pray that as we go out and Lord, as we um, manage those assets that you have given us, God, I pray that you would be first in our minds, that we um, would use everything that we have to honor and glorify you, Lord, whether it's in the small moments of life, like spending our time feeding our kids lunch, Lord, or um, the big times of evangelizing or preaching or bringing people to Christ. God, we can use all the things we have to honor you. God, I pray that you would guide us in how to honor you with our time and our resources, Lord, so that we can see more of our friends and family in heaven and so that we can grow closer to you, Lord. God, help us to use our lives now to prepare to see you one day so that when we give an account that we will be able to look back and smile and tell you all the wonderful things that we have done. God, it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.